if the check is in soup, so can I press it? Sure. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Are you going to have a Oh, yeah. I'm sure. So, as soon as that moves, oh, I guess I can do it up here. Yeah. Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm going to maybe take off the mask so that people can hear me better. But I may put it back on as well. I don't know. Um, <laughs> Maybe to start, if, um, if folks want to, I've got a lot of handouts, and sometimes when I'm in a session and I'm listening to a really long PowerPoint, which is really interesting, but it's also really long, I kind of like to glance down and kind of sort through stuff. So if you folks would like to go ahead and take all the handouts now, you're welcome to do that, and then we can start in like two minutes. Yeah. Um, 
since 2014. And my mentor is uh, Bill McCormick in the Rocky Mountain Seed Alliance. And in two and a half weeks, he's coming to Ohio and through Agraria, through a partnership with Agraria, where you're going to be later tonight, uh, and Antioch College and some other organizations, we're offering a heritage grain school. And some of the uh, seeds over here, we're going to do a seed ID activity in a little while. Some of these are some of the heritage grains that we grew. We had heritage trials at Agraria and at Antioch. And so I'm pretty excited about bringing grain back and creating a local grain chain or grain shed, uh, which is kind of the next thing we need to do. We've kind of got uh, vegetables a little bit covered at this point with, with farmers markets and things, but grain is really important with calorie crops. So that's just a little information about me. Some of these slides today I based on uh, some of the work of Bill McDormand. So today we're gonna to talk about decolonizing seed. And really, um, I'll give you some resources at the end too. There's a lot of folks working on decolonization right now, or rather, or in addition to rematriation, so getting seeds back. And some of you may be familiar with this work, and some of you may be doing this work already. So I encourage you to share. Um, you know, when we're doing the, uh, the this, I'm going to go straight through the PowerPoint, but in the second hour, we're going to be doing a lot of hands-on activities. So I encourage you folks to share with each other. So this will be us touching each other. So really, sometimes I think you all are in the field, but you know sometimes people don't realize how critical seed is. If we, if we don't have seed sovereignty, we don't have food sovereignty. And um, seed is, the genetic diversity of seed is really important. And 97% of the diversity in vegetables has been lost since 1900. So this gives us a chance to, um, when we say seed, we create a living seed bank. You all know about the Svalbard Seed Bank and all these seed banks all over the world, which is great. They're great for, for uh, catastrophes. But how do we keep that seed fresh? When you put seed in a seed bank, when you pull it out, you're, you're pulling it out at a different point in time, a different point in time, at a different point in the stream, right? So if we keep seed fresh by exchanging it with each other every year, then we are a living seed bank. Seed saving is also a wonderful community building activity. So I mentioned 97% uh, of the vegetable diversity estimated has been lost since 1900. And, and this is hard to um, categorize and quantify because we'll talk about it later, but the way that uh, the corporations split off and, and go back like this, 60 to 75% of the world's commercial seed, and I'm talking about cowrie crops, grain crops essentially, but also vegetables are owned by three or four agrochemical companies now. And I see uh, you taking a picture, which is wonderful. All, uh, totally fine. I'm also happy to send the PowerPoint later if you want to grab my email. I could, I'm happy to do that. Okay, so so really the important thing, so this is kind of a lecture, this first part, and I know y'all sat through a lot today, but I feel it's really important to contextualize and sort of understand how we got where we are right now. And then the second part will be the fun part where we, where we do fun activities. So, the history of seed saving in the United States. This is really important um, because if we're, I'm gonna talk about patenting. Oh, what just happened? Let's see if I click on one, will it go back? Okay. So the, the current, the germplasm today in the United States um, is, is a mix of a lot of different things. So it's a mix of settler uh, seed, people that, you know, seed that, that, that colonists brought, um, a lot of seed from the Colombian Exchange, which is, you know, preceded settler colonialism, plants from the enslaved diaspora, and, and plants from settlers, and then indigenous plants. So, uh, you know, when settlers came, of course, there was uh, incredible um, seed already here, the genetic diversity was vast, and indigenous peoples stewarded that seed. So some of the uh, indigenous Seed is what we have in our seed germplasm today in the United States. Some of the things that are indigenous, um, that indigenous people stewarded, you can see persimmon, pawpaw, wild rice, ferns, ramps, some squash, corn, beans, peppers, things that you kind of think of when you think of um, indigenous plants in the United States. So some of the uh, germplasm from enslaved uh, the diaspora, African diaspora, black-eyed peas, okra, watermelon, coffee, all sorts of things. But they, so 
the enslaved diaspora did not only bring these seeds with them, sometimes braided into their hair. You've heard of those, you've heard those stories, but they also brought their knowledge with them. And this was critical um, to uh, this South, Southeast United States. So settler colonials did not know how to grow the things in that kind of uh, uh, climate. Mm -hmm. And folks from Africa did know how. So they brought their knowledge with them, which was critical. So some of the things, uh, in addition to uh, some of the things I just mentioned, so cotton, black eyed peas, sorghum. I'm growing some uh, sorghum this summer uh, for the Heritage Grain School, and it's just so beautiful. Um, there's so many different kinds of heritage sorghum. So these are some of the things that went back and forth from one continent to the other with the Colombian exchange. Dandelions are not indigenous to this country. Uh, honey, uh, honeybees are uh, not indigenous to the United States, as you probably know. Sugarcane, wheat, bananas, coffee, tea, and yams. So when the colonizers came to the United States, a lot of the seed that they brought with them was with wealthy landowners, you know, plantation owners. And they wanted to see which seeds they brought with them would work well here. And some of them worked and some of them didn't. And, so, and sometimes they ran into uh, catastrophes because, you know, they almost starved. And they were saved by uh, seed that was here with the indigenous uh, folks. So at this time, many of the landowners, um, these wealthy landowners, Thomas Jefferson, George Washington, they started seed societies. This is a picture of uh, Monticello. And they traded this seed back and forth. And they encouraged folks to plant this seed and to see if it would grow here. And they were also at the same time exploring uh, indigenous seed that was already here. And then, and then again, the seed from the African diaspora. So in 1839, um, originally the commissioner of patents, uh, so originally seed was in the patent office, not with the USDA. And he secured funding to collect and distribute agricultural seed. 10 years after it started, the patent office had distributed 60,000 packages. And by 1855, they had shipped out over a million seed packages. And they shipped these to farmers. They wanted to give these to farmers for free, have them grow them out, see what worked, what didn't. It was, it was a, and to, you know, this was, this was colonialism, it was to establish uh, farms. And the seed was free. The successor to this, so in a lot of, several different acts um, during the Lincoln administration that were really critical to, um, to what ended up happening with farming in the United States. Of course, one of huge one was, was the land grant system. But uh, another one was the establishment of USDA. And at the time, the purpose of the establishment of USDA was to give away free seed. 30% of their budget was to give away free seed. Think about what the USDA does today. Mm -hmm. what, are, what are some of the, what's the biggest program of the USDA today? Does anybody know? Yeah. They are managed by the company. Uh, they're using their law. SNAP. SNAP, right. SNAP's the biggest program. So the supplement and the school lunch program, and those are very connected. And so if, if kiddos are on free and reduced lunch, uh, school districts are required to buy commodities because we produce too much food in the United States. It's not that there's a hunger problem, it's that the food's not getting to the right people that need it. But there's an overproduction of so many things with commodities. And so they need a place to dump all that food and they require school districts to buy it for, the, for this uh, school lunch program. So 15 years after it was established, a third of the budget was devoted to the free seed distribution. And at the same time, there were a lot of seed companies forming. They were not happy that seed was being given away for free. And they formed uh, lobbies and they started lobbying Congress to try to get rid of this free seed program. So in 1883, the officially the American Seed Trade Association was formed. And their primary goal was to stop the free seed program. They didn't succeed until 1924. But in 1924, it was eliminated. So there was a lot of things happening around the turn of the last century. Uh, the free seed program was eliminated. People kind of rediscovered Mendel again. And uh, that work is what led to the hybridization of corn. People kind of sort of remembered Mendel's work and started working with it. The other thing that happened at the, about the same time, which we'll talk about in a second, is 
copyright laws in the United States changed and how they, how they work at that time. So with hybridization, this is, this is some of the work that was happening at the land grant colleges. There was some built-in protection for those who were you know, working with that plant breeding because you know, there's a lot of work that goes into it, right? So again, uh, the establishment of the land grant colleges. So, and I just mentioned uh, copyright laws and the way that worked changed profoundly in 1923. However, the, the concept of patent was still there. So it wasn't living things. It was something that was created or invented. So farmers, since the beginning of time, have always shared their seed and grown their own seed. And they could still do that at this time. So this is what a patent means. It's exclusive rights granted by a sovereign state to an investor for a limited period of time in exchange for detailed public disclosure of an invention or a solution to a specific problem. It's not, you can't patent something that's living at this time. In 1930, this is the first time that we start to see seed patenting. So the Plant Patent Act, and this had to do with Luther Burbank out in California and all the really interesting stuff that he was doing, but it was all about asexually reproduced plants. And so the very first one, it wasn't the David Austin rose, but it was a rose. And so it was asexual propagation and it could be patented. But still, seeds are not patented. In 1961, the Universal Protection of Varieties Convention in, in, uh, was formed uh, in Geneva. And how many of you know about the UPOV? There's a lot of work being done by seed sovereignty folks to try to stop UPOV because this is profoundly affecting farmers around the world. And so La Vida Campesina is um, a, an international mm -hmm. uh, a peasant organization that's trying to work against, and, you know, and to, and to save their right to save seed, which is, so they're fighting uh, the work of the UPOB. So when this really starts to change is in 1970, we have the Plant Variety Protection Act. And so PVP, I don't think these seeds have it, sometimes on the back of the seed packet, you'll see it says PVP. Has anybody ever seen that on a seed packet? So Plant Variety Protection Act means farmers can still save their own seed, but they can't sell that seed to anybody. They can't, there's, there's starts to be some kind of limitation on seeds. You can still, you know, save your own, but you can't give it away. You can't trade it. You can't sell it. So when the Plant Variety Protection Act came in, a lot of seed companies, a lot of bigger seed companies started gobbling up smaller seed companies. And so each time, each one of these slides I'm showing you, patenting is increasing and our, our ability to save our own seed is decreasing with each one of these things that are happening here. So in 1988, this case went to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court codified the fact that a microorganisms are alive, it doesn't matter if that's without legal significance, anything under the sun, alive or not alive can be patented. And this really opened up the floodgates. In the 1980s, the other thing that started happening was we started to see a lot of biotechnology really, really taking off. And some folks thought, well, you know, maybe we should think about regulating this. I mean, this has a lot of implications here. But uh, President Reagan was the president at the time. And he was very concerned. He was, you know, a business president, right? And he was very concerned about limiting the power of businesses to some of these new technology corporations. He didn't want to limit that work. And so they decided, well, how are we going to regulate this? And so they came up with a coordinated framework for the regulation of biotechnology. And what they decided was, we have laws on the books that protect food additives right now. We don't need any more laws. Biotechnology, you know, if you're, if you're you know, taking a piece of a shark and injecting it into an apple, that's a food additive. We don't need any new laws. We, the laws on the books are sufficient. So then in 1992, the FDA has a policy statement on genetically engineered plant foods. Here's what they say. Genetically modified crops shall be treated as food additives and subject to existing food additive regulation as long as they're generally recognized as safe as determined by the producer. So this is the fox guarding the hen house. 
So here, uh, just as a recap, 1930-1970, the Supreme Court, it, this is the one where genetics are allowed to be patented for the first time. So not just the seeds can be patented, but the traits of seeds can be patented now. And this is really crucial. And this is where these companies started buying up all these kinds of seeds and all these little seed companies had all this genetic diversity. And then now that you know they own these big companies own that genetic diversity. And you know, and they they do research with it, but they, a lot of it just got you know put on a back burner. And so we lost a lot of our genetic diversity. And then the money that they were doing for plant breeding and research got put into three or four or five kinds of or whatever. So this has really big implications because in 1972, I think there was, a, there was a blight and I can't remember the name of the blight, but there were three or four or five kinds of corn being grown in the whole United States. And we were really into monocropping at that point. And it devastated the crops because the four or five different kinds were all prone to this particular virus. So now we have, more, so this really has to do a lot with decolonization. And rematriation because we can't save our own seed now. Indigenous folks can't save their own seed. Peasants around the world can't save their own seed. Some of you have heard of Vandana Shiva and her work in India and um, the, the numerous farmers who have committed suicide in India um, because they can't save their own seed and they have to buy their own seed. They have to buy seed from the companies now and they buy the seed, drought comes, they lose their crop, they, they have no money. They take out loans to buy more seed for the next year because they can't save the seed and they commit suicide. They, they go into so much debt, they commit suicide. So it's a big problem. So these are some of the genetically engineered crops we have in the United States today. So I talked about um, you know, how much seed is owned by these few companies, and it's hard to quantify because of the complexity of the structure. So some patents, when uh, you know, one company gobbles up another company, some of those patents remain with the former company. Some of them transfer over here. There's takeovers. Uh, there's just a lot of different things that happen, but I'm going to show you a little bit that you can, this is kind of a nice visual. So in 2011, mm -hmm. these were the companies you can see Monsanto, you know, Monsanto is always the one we like to talk about, right? Um, in 2011, they owned 26% of the world's uh, calorie crops, the grains. DuPont had 18%. So this is 2011. Now look at, look at this graph. Now look at the next page. So DuPont goes up to 32% in one year. Monsanto now has 30, Syngenta has 10. And then all the other little seed companies in the world are 16%. Okay, 2012. As of 2018, I need to update these slides. Dow and DuPont merged in 2015, and then they divided into three companies, including Corteva. ChemChina acquired Syngenta, Bayer acquired Monsanto, and then Bayer's seed divisions were sold to BASF. And now see these four firms control well over 60%. So you can see Bayer, you can see just how these all got gobbled up. So that's a little bit hard to see with that thing there. Um, in 2012, this is again, uh, my statistics are 10 years old and I really need to update these slides, but the commercial seed market, let's say that it's 40, it was 47 billion. Let's say it was a line that was eight feet long. The US part of that market was two feet long. So we had a fourth of the seed of the world here. The organic and small company seed sales were one fifth of an inch of that eight foot long line. So organic is still very small and it's, you know, it's, it's critical. So 12 plants supply 75% of the food in the world. 12 plants, most of the genetic diversity of which has been lost, most of which is owned by three or four companies. You see where we're, this is kind of scary, isn't it? So three plants, 50% uh, of the world's food comes from three plants, rice, wheat, and corn. So we have this big movement now for seeds and growing movement for seed sovereignty. We need to save and share seed for security. Um, we need to have this seed adapted better. And, and what I say here, y'all know about agriculture zones, agricultural zones. For those of you in Ohio, in Southwest Ohio here, we used to be 5B and now we're 6A. Where are you all from? Anybody from outside of Ohio? Do you know what your zone is? What's your zone? You don't know, okay, anybody know their zone? Michigan, fine. 
Five, five, just straight five. Okay. Six B, I believe. Okay. Yeah. Right. Because it, it's not just like this. It depends on the. Yeah. Yeah. Anybody else know their zone? Six A. Okay. So here's the thing. When you look on a package of seed, we've all bought seed that will say it's good for zone 6A, right? So Dayton, Ohio is 6A now. I'm from, I'm from Colorado originally. Denver is 6A. Think about the climate between Denver and Dayton, how different the climate is, how different the soils are. So seeds, uh, seeds bred commercially are bred to be good for as, as, as wide a uh, audience as possible. And sometimes on a seed pack, it says all American seeds. And that means, you know, it, it, it's 6A. It's, it does sort of well, mostly in every 6A, but there's a lot of different 6As. So what we need to be doing is taking seed and regionalizing. We need seed that grows well in Dayton, Ohio, you know, because we have a little microclimate here, just like y'all do. And so we need to be creating land races. Oh. Well. Okay, so I want to talk just a second about seed law. Seed law exists for a reason. And so there's a lot of interstate seed laws. So if you send bad seed with viruses or whatever in it across, you know, it's going to affect everywhere. And so you have to be careful with seed. And that's where we have our, our laws about it. So the American Association of Seed Control Officials, there's one, um, usually at the Department of Agriculture in every state, there'll be some person who's in charge of uh, the ASCO portion. So what started happening when we started saving seed at you're from Pennsylvania, do you remember in 2014, was it? Uh, there was a seed library started forming and the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture said, wait a minute, that violates the seed law. You can't, you can't share seeds at a library. And what was happening was they were taking a hammer to hit a, a plea. It, there just weren't law, the, the, the right level of laws that existed at that level. There were only these super big laws. And so they created the Russell Amendment, uh, recommended uniform state seed law. They made an amendment to this. And so now, and it's different for every state, um, you can have seed libraries in most states because they created this new level of law to say, wait a minute, this, they're just sharing seed. They're not selling it. They're not you know, sending it across state lines. They're just sharing it locally. There's really nothing wrong with that. So Ohio, we haven't um, bought into the Russell Amendment yet, but we follow the Russell Amendment. So we just don't have it codified in the Ohio Revised Code yet. Uh, the last I looked, there were 16 states that had actually codified the Russell Amendment so that it's, it's very legal to share seed. Um, in most states, it's again, they, they sort of follow it even if they haven't codified it yet. So this is changing and it's changing for the good. So how do you know if a seed is patented if you're purchasing seed? Um, it has to say so on the packet. It will say if it's patented or not. Um, a lot of you might be buying seed from organic seed companies and um, small seed companies. A lot of those are open pollinated seed and they're not uh, patented. So there's this new thing. It's kind of the opposite of patenting seed. It's called the Open Source Seed Initiative. And if you can pay, you know, just a little, a few pennies more when you buy a packet of seed to buy a packet that has this symbol on the packet, you're supporting companies that are vowing that they will never patent seed. They're going to keep it open as long as they can. And that means they have to, they have to charge a little bit more for that. And so it's really a nice thing to support the open source seed initiative companies. And so this is the little the thing they put on the seed packet. It says that, you know, we're not, we're not ever going to patent seed. And if you buy this seed, you agree that you won't ever participate in patenting it either. So the Safe Seed Pledge uh, was formed by High Mowing Organic Seeds, which is up in Vermont. And um, they have a stance, you know, that they'll, same, it's, a, it's a kind of a similar thing. We must protect the foundation for the benefit of all farmers. We pledge we do not knowingly sell genetically engineered seeds or plants. Now there's the, another thing that's happening, the patent free seed campaign. What's happening now, even with organic companies and these small little companies is uh, it's this um, patenting problem with the traits and some of the traits, even in open pollinated seed are starting to be patented now. And so they're trying to start another campaign where these little companies will, you know, have another logo and say this is patent-free seed. So it's, it's 
people are trying to to turn this big ship around. Yeah. Um, when you talk about patenting, you said it has to say it's patented. Like I'm thinking of Johnny's because they're kind of big, but still a lot of small scale brewers use them. But I don't think a lot of their descriptions say that it's patented. So maybe I'm looking in the wrong location. I'm just imagining that more of theirs probably are than like a Fedco or a high Moe. But it's still a low number of theirs that are patented. It's, it's what I, well again, this is this is information from my my seed mentor. Yeah. Bill McDermott from the Rocky Mountain Sea Wines, and what he shared with us was that it, if it doesn't say patented on the package, it's not patented. So, so they can get in trouble if they're selling it out saying that it's patented. I mean, if, it's, if that particular thing is patented, they, or they have to say. <laughs> okay, so there's something happening now. The, there's a, a, you've read about. I think I gave some handouts to Bill Gates Initiative, and so there, you know, Bill Gates, um, in his mind, is is really you know trying to work with. Uh, making enough food for everybody, but what they're doing is they're—he's doing it through these great big, huge uh, corporations again that are devastating the small farmer. So it's really like the green revolution, but it's—you uh, know—they're pushing that in Africa now, and it's—it's it's all about technology and 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 bio bio uh, engineering. So more than 85% of Africa's seed supply comes from you know, small farmers, tiny little farmers. But what's happening is they're, they're stopping that work and really sort of pushing this, this biochemical or this uh, bioengineering, um, bioengineered seeds. So these multinational corporations that own these three that own between 60 and 75%, it's, this is what's happening now. It's, it's getting even more so. So I think a lot of you folks are in the, in the business, you're in the agriculture business, I assume. And so, you know, kind of a, a lot about this already, but I teach sometimes to people that just really don't have a clear understanding. A lot of times people say, well, what's wrong with, you know, genetic engineering? Why is that different from plant breeding? Well, it's very different from plant breeding. People have been breeding seed forever, you know, crossing seed and, and but genetically engineered is, is, it can be very different. Open pollinated versus hybrid. Does everybody understand about that? So, okay. So just a little thing that somebody, people, some people don't know sometimes about, whoops. Oh dear, okay. I'm not used to the screen. Take two fingers and shrink it. No, no, one hand, two hands. Like this? That might work. Uh, someone want to? I think about this if we do this. Ah, is it real big? Go on to the next one and see what happens. Yeah, I can't. It seems to be stuck. Hmm. hmm? It's not happy. I might have to go to the other one. Oh boy. Wow, that's exciting. Here, hold on. This is yours, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, yeah, well, yeah, except we don't know. We'll go down here. You know where you want. Let's see. Sorry, hold on for a second. Chat amongst yourselves. You've been busy. <laughs> A lot of slides. I'll see. Okay. Getting that close. Getting there. We're getting there. Okay. Yep. Okay. No, almost. Almost this one. Okay. Okay. Let's go to this one. Okay. All right. Slideshow. No, slideshow. I think it's going to go to this one. Okay. Here we go. Uh, oh, we're good. Then, okay. 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 Life is good. Okay. And then resume slideshow. Okay, hit the wrong button. My bad. Try again. I think so. This one? Yeah. Gotcha. Okay, okay. I think I think I think we have it. Okay, sorry. 
that's okay. 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 So a lot of you, I think, already know about this. This is a this is an audience who's, who's done this work before. But to create a hybrid seed, you take a homozygous parent from a, two homozygous parents. So you have seed from this parent and seed from this parent. You have a trait here. You have a trait here, and you cross them, and then you have an F1. So it's an F1 hybrid. It's a first generation hybrid, and you create. Uh, you know, you're taking the the trait from two. Maybe you have a, a large orange tomato, and you have uh, a, a narrow red tomato, and you want to cross those to get um, a narrow orange tomato, for example. Keep going. So, uh, something that people think is that you can't save hybrid seed, that it won't be true. And it won't necessarily be true, but it might be true to type. So, what you do is you, you, you uh, stabilize the seven or eight generations, then it becomes open pollinated again. Do you see what I'm saying? So, you keep you keep um, selecting out and then it becomes stable enough that it can be considered open pollinated and so it will come back stable every year. So open pollinated is regionally adapted and it's stable. So you can see all the genetic diversity in there, right? Whereas a hybrid is one size fits all. It's again, it's kind of like the all American uh, sign that you see on seeds packages. So let's talk a little bit about germination rate. We're gonna do an activity later. So no seeds have 100% germination rate. This, has, this is important when you think about interstate seed law. Um, seed companies are allowed to sell the minimum germination rate. And so different, um, different types of plants have different germination rates. Typically peppers have about a 55% germination rate. So, um, I mean, it can, it can vary widely, but just sort of um, as, a, as a, what do you call it? Uh, Average, thank you. I'm a little scattered today. Um, so uh, a seed company can sell a packet of seeds that there's that 55% of those are, are viable. Good seed companies will sell 100% viability. And so you pay more for that. So if you get, you know, if you go to Dollar General and you get three packets of seeds for a dollar, that germination rate, A, they may not have been stored properly, or um, they may have used that minimum germination rate, right? But if you get fresh seed from a really reliable company, that's going to be 100%. So that's why it's important to, when you're saving your own seed from year to year, to do a germination test before you plant it. And now we need to know that I'm going to zip through this fairly quickly so we can get to the fun stuff. But if you're going to save seed, you need to know how the seed is pollinated. Because if it's wind pollinated, it can cross. Some seeds are self-pollinated or some plants. So we'll just go through this pretty quickly. Um, if a plant come, uh, has a perfect flower, uh, some of those are selfers and some of those are crossers, but some uh, plants that are selfers, some examples are tomatoes, peppers, peas, beans, and lettuce. So they have the male and the female within the flower and they self-pollinate. And so mostly if you're starting to save seeds, self-pollinated seeds are the, are the best ones to start with because you don't have to worry too much about cross-pollination. Now, tomatoes are a good example um, bumblebees, I love this story. There's a great TED talk. Um, Marla Stood, I guess her name. So tomatoes are self-pollinating, but um, it, it's very sticky. And so you kind of need, they kind of need a, to be bumped a little bit so that the pollen falls off and, and gets where it needs to go. Bumblebees can, they can go in there and pollinate, but it's kind of hard for them to get into a, a, a perfect flower. But what bumblebees do is they're attracted to tomatoes and they go up to tomatoes and they're sonicating, right? They're, they're, this is, and so that, that vibration causes the, the pollination to happen. Isn't that lovely? So there are some perfect flowers that are crossers and some example of those are broccoli, cabbage, and so the brassicas. Um, and so some flowers are, are, some plants have imperfect flowers. And so there's only male parts or female parts. And some of these are corn, squash, spinach. Again, uh, some of those, we'll go into this in a second, but venetius and dioecious. So this is, gets a little bit complicated, but some crossers are corn, squash, spinach, melons, cucumbers, and watermelons. So selfers are perfect flowers. That are, here's some that are perfect flowers to so self-pollinating. Um, crossers are either perfect or imperfect, and they uh, cross-pollinate cabins between plants. So here's some example of a crossers with perfect flowers, but they're self-incompatible. So the brassicas, even though there are they're perfect flowers, they need another one to pollinate. Oh my God. Did I just go back to the very beginning? 
I'm so sorry. Can someone help me? Really sorry. Can you like zoom out more? I think we'll go back to your full. Yeah. Okay. But we at Antioch College, we have like a hundred students who are a micro college and we're really under resourced and we don't have these smart screens. So I don't know what I did. I'm just trying to let's see where were you at? Okay, here we are. Okay, let's just go this way. Okay, okay, there. And, and you're still you're she's still in the system. So um so the pollinators are um pollination methods, self-pollination, wind, insect pollination, or combination. So I love this picture. Isn't that beautiful? So here's an example. I have a list here. I gave you all a list here. Um, if you're starting to save seed, you can just kind of look and see. So amaranth, for example, is wind pollinated. And to get a stable population, you would need at least 10 plants. And since it's wind pollinated, if you, you would do, if you were doing isolation, they need to be like two miles apart or they could cross by wind pollination if you had two different kinds of amaranth. Um, beets are wind pollinated. And typically the tinier the seed, the more likely it is to be wind pollinated, just as a, as a rough rule. So this is just kind of a nice thing that you can see. Now, um, this is important to know, but there's also ways to protect pollination. Even if they're wind pollinated, you can still plant them closely together if you use some of these techniques I'm going to show you about. Okay, so the first thing to do is know your families and know what can cross and what can't. So species can't cross, but varieties within species can. So for example, beets and chard can actually cross. They're in the same species. But beets and quinoa can't. They're in the same family, but not the same species. Another example, acorn squash and zucchini can cross. They're in the same species. But squash and cucumbers can't. They're the same family, but not the same species. So, and I'll just go through the different families, the crop families, the goosefoot families, beets and chard, mustard, uh, parsley family, carrots, parsnips, nightshades. We all know about our nightshades. And this includes tobacco, which is interesting. Which That's why you get your tobacco mosaic virus on your tomatoes. And then the gourd family, composites are kind of a lot of things that just they put in one thing that they didn't really fit anywhere. And then the lily family are your onions and things. And then the grass family is your corn. And then mallow is okra. Okay, one thing you can do is decide whether you need to obsess about whether they cross or not. Maybe it doesn't matter. Maybe you want to create the crosses, right? So it depends on how you're saving seed and what your, what your intention is. Maybe you're wanting to save a very particular variety and make sure it's, you know, it, it doesn't get crossed with anything. And there are techniques we can use for that. Okay, so really quickly, you can isolate by space. Make it far enough apart, like two miles apart if it's going to cross. That's kind of hard if you have a neighbor who's growing a different kind of beet than you are, right? You can isolate by timing, and they do this a lot with corn, and something happened out of agraria where you're going to go later tonight for dinner. Um, it, it's surrounded by, by traditional uh, corn farmers, but they uh, have small farmers who are doing organic corn. And so uh, Jason Ward is our, our farmer out there, and he comes from a traditional farm family. He knew exactly what to do, and so he was planting his, uh, he was doing it by timing so that the pollen wouldn't cross. So he waited until after the other farmers had planted. He waited two weeks till he planted his, but then the other farmers' corn got rained out and they replanted. And so it ruined his whole um, his whole crop. It got contaminated. <laughs> Sorry, we'll, we'll put that back up in a minute, and then we're gonna that'll be one of our activities. Okay, so then you can um, you can isolate by cages and they have a lot of pollination cages out at the seed savers exchange in decorah iowa if you ever get a chance to go out there it's a magical place and since covid they've had their uh, conferences online but a really fun thing is to go the third week in july to the conference and you meet cd friends from all over the world and it's really fun and you get to see their beautiful fields and this this is how they do it is um, with pollination uh, caging and so you can do alternate day caging so if you have um you know, two things nearby, you can uh, uh, take the one thing that you don't want to cross and do all of, cage all of them, and then the next day cage the other one so that they can pollinate with each other but not cross. This is 
protection hoops, you can put it across the whole thing, but then you have to put bees inside so that they can pollinate. Um, blossom bags. So this is, um, you can get these from Fedco, and this would go over like a pepper plant, or, or not pepper plant, a good example, because that's self-pollinating, but these go over plants, you can put them over the whole plant. These are blossom bags, and you just put them over the, the flower itself, and then you pull it down, and that pre prevents, this is, um, prevents against insect pollination. And you can get those online too. I kind of use Amazon more than I should. And you can get dozens of those bags for really, really cheaply. But you know, try to support Fedco on the other places if you can. <clears throat> you can hand pollinate, and that's another way to prevent uh, cross-pollination. That's a really fun activity to do with kids. I should have brought some in today because it's something else we could have done. So you can see it's it's really easy, particularly on squash and cucumbers, to tell the female and the male flower. So this is the female, and there's the ovum. And the male just is it's just a stem. And so, you know, before I started getting into this, when I just, you know, years ago, I would say, oh, look, there's, you know, there's 30 blossoms on my squash. I'm going to have so many squash. And then I get three squash. And that was because most of those flowers were male. And the male flowers come on first, typically, with squash. And so um, when you see those female plants, it's a really great idea to go ahead and hand pollinate and grab some of that pollen and go ahead and and hand pollinate and then close that off if you're saving seed um, so that you'll make sure and get pollination and, and without crossing. So this is how you do it. You can, you can also just use a Q-tip and then you close it off with some masking tape or something to make sure that you know, it doesn't cross pollinate with other insects coming in. And then how will you remember that though? So, you can do it this way too. You want to put a little ribbon uh, on the stem so that you'll know in the fall that that's the one that you, that, you know, that, that didn't get contaminated. Okay. So how do you know which seed to save? Probably a lot of us want to save all the seeds, but it's not necessarily a good idea because you want to save for health. So, Okay, I'm kind of zipping through this so we can get to the fun stuff. So here's what happens. I always, you know, when I start my seed in, in February or March, some of it comes up and, and some of it doesn't. And I want to just save every single plant that comes up. But if you're trying to save seed for the following year, a great thing to do is to take some of these that are not quite as healthy, you know, they're smaller, and go ahead and pull those out right at the beginning. And that just kills you to do that. But if you're, if you're saving for seed, it's a great thing to do because you're only having really healthy plants right from the start. So you can look in the field and just kind of look at, you know, which plants are best. A harvest, you can select at harvest time. Or afterwards, you can look at, you know, if you're going to say, maybe you don't want to save all the seed from a particular cob. You want to actually literally find, you know, the plumpest um, kernels. And natural selection of, you know what, this is, this is generic, right? Because this could have been, this could have been a gully here, and that's what, you know, there's, there's a lot of different reasons this can happen, but just generally speaking, just try to look for the healthiest plant. Okay, and then maybe that's exactly what you want to do is cross as many things as you can, and that's how we create new varieties and things. And so this is called painted mountain corn. Dave Christensen uh, created this, I think, in the 70s, and he crossed 71 different strains of corn and stabilized it out. And so there's a ton of variety, right? Um, within a corn. And so the other word for land race is uh, called grex, and it means flock. And so this is a three root grex beet created by Alan Kapuler by crossing, he cross yellow intermediate, crossbeet, purple Egyptian, and left saddle leaf. And so when he plants out this seed, this is what he gets. And so this is beautiful. It's not what we're used to, but it's beautiful because in a particular year, you know, if something doesn't, if um, a virus affects something in one of these, it's not going to affect, you know, there's, there's, there's so much variety here that it's really, it helps us to stabilize our food. So then that's really fun to make intentional crosses if you kind of get into breeding. So this was um, a sweet Dakota rose that uh, crossed black diamond in early Canada, got the sweet Dakota rose. So diversity is resilience. And so that's what we really need to be thinking about now. Um, Another reason I'm excited about Heritage Grain School. So my, my cousins are, are Kansas wheat farmers. And this year, they got about a third of their yield. Um, they planted, you know, you put wheat in the fall, they planted in the fall, and then it never rained, ever. It never rained, ever. 
no snow, no rain. And um, they weren't even gonna harvest. And they ended up getting a little bit of rain in April. And they went ahead and had a little bit of a harvest. In Southwest Kansas, they didn't even harvest. It was just, it was nothing to harvest. And so we need to get that resilience. We need to be bringing in um, seed that is drought resistant. And so another tragedy that happened a few years ago, uh, the native seed search in Southwest, um, they're, they're based in Arizona in the Southwest, they work with dryland seeds. They work with seeds that are, I mean, you can grow corn on four inches of rain a year. And so that is really important. I mean, we're losing our water all over the world. The Syrian seed bank, it, it had a lot of the dryland seed in the world saved in their seed bank. And Aleppo was attacked a few years ago and we lost some of that, but folks risked their lives in disguised UN white vans and they, got in there as, as it was being bombed and captured as much of that seed as they couldn't put in those vans and drove them across the border to Jordan and then up to the Svalbard Seed Bank. The Svalbard Seed Bank itself last summer flooded because the Arctic Circle is, is, is you know, getting warmer much faster than we are. And the seed was not damaged, but the water just, I'll, I'll show you a picture, just flowed into there and they were able to save it. But who knows what's going to happen next. So that's another reason that it's important for us to be living seed banks and not just have these seed banks where we you know, hope that everything will be okay. Another, another great story, uh, Bob, Bobby Love, uh, Nicholas Bobby Love, you know, had, had, had that he was a botanist who traveled all over the world, had amazing seed and it was in the uh, seed bank in uh, St. Petersburg. And in World War II, as the Germans had, you know, the story the Germans had surrounded the city and it was a large city and the, the Russians were starving. They were eating the cats, the alley cats, you know, I mean, they were starving and they needed to protect this incredibly important seed. And so the scientists locked themselves in the seed bank because also, you know, the Russians themselves would have stormed it, right? It's to get the grain to eat, let alone, you know, the Germans. And so they locked themselves in the seed bank and they themselves starved to death saving the seed. I mean, it's, it's an incredible story. Okay, so I hope that all of you will be interested in maybe learning more about saving seed and working towards seed sovereignty, seed sovereignty for ourselves, and then, and then to take that the next step to seed remateriation, getting seed back to the people from whom we stole it. So these are a few general resources. Um, Richmond Grows Seed is out of Richmond, California, and they kind of wrote the book on seed libraries. They have so many wonderful resources if you're interested in starting a seed library. This is a great video about organic seed. And so the other thing is if you wanna grow organic um, vegetables, it's great to start with organic seed. And the thing about organic seed, the Organic Seed Alliance, they don't baby their seeds. Um, they grow them in harsh conditions because, and then they're selecting out for that. And so if you start with organic seed, you're gonna be more successful than if you take other seed that's really been babied at the companies and then try to grow it organically because organically it's, it's harder to grow without pesticides. Okay, um, this is a great um, website. And then a couple of great movies, and these are just on Amazon now. Um, the, the Seed, The Untold Story, and Open Sesame, The Story of Seeds, really, um, really inspiring work that people are doing. And major seed seed, Bill McNorman's in that, in that movie, and a lot of the other ones. Hudson Valley Seed Shed and Native American Seed Sanctuary, those are folks working on rematriation. This hasn't happened for two years, but the National Heirloom Expo was started by, um, oh, what's his name, Gerald um, yeah, Baker Creek Seeds, which is itself uh, under a controversy right now. But the Heirloom Expo is in Santa Rosa and it's so much fun. If you ever get a chance to go, it's the second week in September. Rocky Mountain Seed Alliance, Native Seed Search I mentioned, and then Seed Savers Exchange. So these are, um, Good websites to look at for decolonization. Dryland Farming, Sierra Seeds is, is run by Rowan White, a Mohawk seed keeper. Uh, restoration Seeds, these are places to get some of this indigenous seed and to grow it out and then to like give it back to folks. So on the Antioch Farm over at Antioch College, we have two projects. One is Seed for Threatened Communities. And so Dayton, Ohio is uh, a welcome friendly city. So we have a lot of immigrants from a lot of different places and you know, Food is culture, right? And so when you're displaced and you come to a new place and you don't have access to your own food, it's, it's really hard. And so we're growing out some of that food. We have stuff from Syria, Sudan, Honduras, and we're growing it out and then we're gonna 
share it with those displaced communities. Um, and then we have a rematriation project going as well. Okay, True Love Seeds out of Philly. Um, they have a great African diaspora collection. And then here's three, there's a lot of great seed books, but these are three books. Uh, this is how to start seed. And then this book is really lovely. Um, Virginia Nazarene is an anthropologist at the University of Georgia. Uh, she's a Filipina um, who, who did a lot of her work in the Philippines. And she just writes beautifully about the stories behind seed. So it's really that somatic connection. And so what I like to say to my students is we all already are seed savers. We're just one or two generations away. But it's, you know, some of that is somatic. It's, it's, it's in our DNA to know how to save seed. And so when we, can when we can reconnect with the ancestors, it's just a really beautiful thing. And so that's part of the rematriation process as well, I think. Okay, so now we're gonna do our things. Does anybody wanna break or should we just get up and start doing the thing? So you guys can, okay. Yeah, if you wanna break there, there might still be um, snacks outside, granola bars that you use fruit, water, maybe some coffee. If I did, You're going fast. The Alliance of Native Sea Keepers got a mix out of Virginia. I lost the last time, but really good folks doing the same thing, too. So they're did Alliance you, of Native Sea Keepers. Oh, did you get that too? That's yeah. great. Yeah, yeah they other folks have resources. They do, they do wonderful things about the seeds and then also offering Native uh, Indigenous men is connected with that seed. The, the story. What's the name of that? The Alliance of Native Sea Keepers. I'll, I'll, uh, there's a couple of Facebook videos that they can just leave, You can answer the question. Yeah, we can leave it up. I was just thinking if I could get him taken care of. We're good. We're good. Okay. No problem. We'll wait just a second uh, for folks to come back. And then the first thing I'd like for people to do, and this is just kind of a fun thing if you're if you're at the beginning of a seed class, is just to have all of you. Let's just do this now. Have you folks? Or people are going, okay, yes. Let me take a little bit of break. And we'll do this in just a couple minutes. I have a question. Yeah. So I don't know if you covered this or not, but what's up with the expiration dates that are on seed packets? That's a good question. So did everybody hear the question about expiration dates on seed packets? Yeah, it is. Expiration date. Who's publishing it? Yeah, they, they are. So, so are. yeah, a, a lot of seed, there's, I mean, reputable companies are actually seed savers have changed their finger, but. Donnie's put what it was last tested, the germ percent was tested. Not, not an expiration. I, I actually am seeing it less and less, but there, there's often an expiration date on the on the, uh, the seeds that say don't use it after this date. Mm -hmm. So if the seed has been stored properly, tomatoes, for example, can be good up to 10 years. You've heard the stories about you know 2,000 year old seeds coming out of clay pots, and you know, um, so it's really important to store it properly. And I just used to uh, just keep it you know on my sideboard, which is okay. But it's it's better to have seed uh, saved in a cool environment. And so the thing to do is to take your seed, put it in. Um, I'm going to pass some of these out. I like to use these for my seed packages. You can, they're just coin things that you get from Office Max. Yeah. And um, so save your seed in here. And that's important. We're going to show you how to label it. And then put that inside a glass jar. Because if you just put it in here and put it in your fridge, or even in here inside of a baggie. It's, it, it's gonna dry it out too much. And so put it in here, put it inside a glass jar and just keep it in your refrigerator. And, and that's, that'll keep that seed fresh and it's gonna, your germination rate will be higher. Just because, uh, and that's why it's, we're gonna do a germination test. That's why it's really important to do a germination test before you start your seeds, because you might have a really low germination rate. That doesn't mean you can't use it. It just means, A, you need to either plant it more thickly, right? If it's a 20% germination rate, you need to plant it five times more thickly to make sure that you're gonna get what you need. Okay, let's actually go ahead. And um, there are one, two, three, four, five, six different signs here. Have a look at the signs. And if you could just go stand underneath the sign that most accurately describes yourself. What we're trying to do is see the sign. See, for yeah, the, the old one, I know we're using that protector for what's And we're using high energy lights and um, high temperature. Oh, that's right. I'd like to talk more about the 
Okay, so here are our signs. This is this sign here says experience gardening. So this is these are the folks who feel like they are pretty experienced gardeners. This one is experience seed saving. So you're just sort of safe seed already. Yay, good. Experience teaching seed saving. <laughs> experience with seed exchanges. So seed libraries or seed swaps. Seed swaps. Oh yeah. Okay. Well, at the group in Mexico, that's where they grow all the seeds and we start. Great. And then experience with seed libraries. We yeah, we order some from Grant the USDA seed library. So. Yeah, and that's out of uh, Fort Collins, right? Uh yeah, some oh, there, there some in Davis for Grant. Yeah, that's great. Okay, and experience okay. with seed companies. Nobody, that's usually nobody. <laughs> <laughs> I visited some and talked to them about it. But <laughs> <laughs> Teaching, uh, so I'm, in this fall, I'm teaching, you know, I think there's a whole quarter, run a quarter system, and we always make our own seed screens. And you can buy seed screens from Fedco, and it used to be you could buy seed screens in any hardware store. Mm -hmm. And uh, Fedco has three different screens that fit inside of each one of the different size, and then you can put them on top of each other, so you get like nine or ten different sizes. And it's just great to, you know, do this. It's also great drying screen. And so, um, I gave you instructions for your you and your students if you want to make your own seed screens. Uh, germination testing. Let's do the seed ID activity first. So, <laughs> so hopefully you all didn't really keep your thing, and um, I'll give it to you afterwards. But and it's really hard. But all of you are going to be able to understand somebody. So there's numbers on here, and if you want to bring a, a pencil and paper over and look at the numbers on the slides, and then try to identify. What's inside and write it down and see how many of them you get. Do we have a list that we're working from? Or do we have to well, I'm going to give you the list afterwards. Okay, all other, all other knowledge. Okay. <laughs> yes. Here we go. How many does it go up to? It's a little bit tight, but um, hopefully we can Yeah, do you go a little bit? Sure. Oh, Tim. Yeah. Yes. And the group's on the farm now. He, he was in my early class this year. Oh, yeah, he told me. Yeah. I said there's a farm. He's a part of our farm that he created. Hi, nice to meet you. Yeah, that's so great. I think that it was uh, Ashy. Yeah. yeah. Three years ago. Yeah. So really. Let's try to get together. I, I'd love to come out and see your place well, and we're going to put some really fun things together. Well, 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 I, yeah, I'd love to come visit. I'm a little bit busy. Are you there, like, are you there in the summer? Or yeah, I'm teaching next week. And then okay. I'll be around later. So I'll probably take the first few weeks. Uh, Let's just email. I still got your email. Um, yeah. And we can maybe figure it out because I'm going away too. And I got it after the screen, so I'm going to take a break to see things. Mm -hmm. Oh, you're just writing down what kind of seed it is. Could you? Oh, please, yes. Yeah, yeah. And send me the I'll pick up my email. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
I think there's one that's really obvious, and I think it doesn't have a number on it. You can just go ahead and Oh, you dropped it. Oh, you found it. Yeah. It's a little crowded, but feel free to come on in and. It's a little hard to set these up in this. I didn't know what the, the room was going to be set up like. So. You live in such a area. Yeah, 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 exactly. Oh, yes. Did you like to
And some of these are unusual, but I just put them in there because they're so beautiful. Yeah, I mean, just oh gosh, there's a there's a Facebook page I should share with you. And it's just it just shows the variety. Of different yeah. I mean, you just cry when you see the Oh, it's from last year as well. Okay. Yeah, but that's the thing. Like, as I said, I'm trying to find some fresh leaves. Yeah, from last year. of 2020. So mullen is really great for the lungs. And in March, that year, I saw more mullen than I'd ever seen anywhere. Okay. To me, it was kind of like the plants were saying, we're here to help. So does anybody know what this is? It kind of looks like a dinosaur, like very ancient. This is the magnolia. And magnolias were here with the dinosaurs. So some plants have come all the way through that time. And so magnolias are one of our oldest plants. This one is pretty, pretty obvious. Anybody? Sumac. Yeah, and you can make sumac lemonade out of it. It's really good. Actually, right now is the time to harvest. 
No, it's not. No, it looks like a little bit, doesn't it? So this is um, uh, from the staghorn sumac tree, and it, it, there's, it's kind of native.